All right, well, good morning, everybody. So um, on X, Twitter, right, uh, something significant happened just a few weeks ago. Twitter is known for being kind of a toxic place if you haven't spent much time there. It can get pretty aggressive. Uh, it could get pretty ugly. But there was a voice that rose up and spoke something incredibly important and incredibly profound. If we could have a look at this. Elmo entered the chat. Elmo asked a question. Elmo is just checking in. How is everybody doing? Now, <laughs> I don't think Elmo, I don't think the good people of Sesame Street had any idea about what they had just started because they took trending to a whole new level as people from all over the, their place started to speak in and to answer Elmo. There were random people that, you know, just people like you and me. There were corporations that were, were speaking. There were celebrity, the President of the United States, the National Suicide and Depression Hotline entered. All this was going on in answer to Elmo's very important question. I got a few those I want to show you. Let's look at the first one. Paddington Bear. Dear Elmo, it was kind of you to check in on all your friends this week. I have been busy making a lot of marmalade. How are you doing? Paddington's such a positive guy. I'm thankful for people like Paddington. Let's look at the next one. Dunkin' Donuts. I could honestly use a nice coffee. Y'all ever feel like that? Got a couple more corporations. Jimmy John's, well, it's the 800th day of January, so... <laughs> yeah, January just kind of seemed like 800 days kind of long for, for me, too. Uh, next one. Oreo cookies ran out of milk. Do the math. That's a problem right there. But then there's this person. Elmo, I've got a level with you, baby. We are fighting for our lives. I don't think she was the only one. Not the bee, so this is the, the lesser stepbrother of Babylon bee, I think. The world is burning, Elmo. No amount of tickles can fix this. Okay. Uh, I don't, Elmo and his tickles. Are, oh, okay, now we've got Elmo. Each day the abyss we stare into grows a unique horror, one that was previously unfathomable in nature. Our inevitable doom, which once accelerated in years, months, now accelerates in hours, even minutes. However, I did have a good grapefruit grape fruit earlier. Thank you for asking. I'm not entirely sure what to do with this one, but we've got another one here. I believe this gentleman is um, part of the Today Show. Uh, he said, thanks for checking in, Elmo. Mondays are hard. Hope you're doing great. Be sure to check on Oscar. He always seems to be in a mood. And then Oscar entered the chat. Grouchy. Last but not least, we've got his good friend Cookie Monster, me doing well. Me would be doing better if me had sub cookies. I feel that. Give me all the cookies, Cookie Monster. So how are y'all doing? That's great. Man, that's great. That's confident answers. I love it. I'll tell you what, I, uh, <laughs> that's been a weird question uh, these last few weeks, and I haven't entirely known how to answer honestly. And I mean, even when I did, I mean, I got creative with my answers. And, you know, if I were to, to be truthful, what was behind whatever answer I may have given you, I mean, it was just like this incredible tangled mess of like, you know, I'm confident in the Lord and I'm seeing his goodness in amazing ways, but like just the tangled mess of all emotions that's all around that. Uh, it was a little nuts inside this head. And so how are you doing? Man, that has been a very complicated answer for me. And I, I suspect the same is true for many of you all. So, you know, as I considered, Lord, what, what would you have us, what passage of scripture would you have a church that's really dealing with a lot of different emotions right now? Where would you have us be? And there was no better place to go than the Psalms. So today we're going to look at Psalm 27. Now, if you're turning in your Bible, and I'd encourage you to do so if you're able, whether you're pointing on your phone or your own Bible. We have Bibles in the chairs throughout the room. If you're turning your own Bible, Psalms pretty easy to find because it's pretty much a uh, open up smack dab in the middle, and uh, you're going to be pretty, pretty close wherever you land. Uh, Psalms 27. Now, a couple disclaimers. Today, we're going to be in the New International Version. I am not switching Bible translations on us, um, but this particular Psalm has been very special in my life. The Lord brought it into my life at a very significant moment. And so like I have eaten and chewed and breathed this psalm 
so many times, and I just, I just know it in the New International Version, and you'll learn why I'm learn, using my old army Bible later. Um, but we're going to Psalm 27. What are the Psalms? Okay, so, I, you know, when we consider the grand story of Scripture, um, it's this... It's, it's this story of what God is doing in the world. And, you know, I think, I think people tend to be very comfortable with the narrative parts of Scripture, right? Because we can enter, we know how to handle story. And then some of us, we, you know, we, we really love theology and doctrine and, and just studying that kind of stuff. So maybe the letters and some of the things that help us deal with, with theology and doctrine, we know what to do with that. But I don't think all of us are as comfortable with the Psalms. We don't really know what to do with the Psalms. How does that fit in the big story of Scripture? Why is it even necessary, right? Just give us, give us the story. Give us what we need to know. But I tell you what, I am so thankful that God has given us the Psalms because that takes us not just across the story, but deep into the lives of the people who are part of the story, people who are very human, people who are also just a tangle of a mess of emotions, right? We hear about all their faith, by faith Abraham, by faith David, by faith, oh, right? But man, these people were struggling, the highs and the lows, just like I know, and feeling all the feels, just like we do. And the Psalms, when we enter into the Psalms, that tells us it's okay. And it is good to be real and raw and not just put on that church face, right, that says, I'm good, I'm okay, no matter what, God is good, which he is. We can't bear that mask, Right? that covers up what we're dealing with. So the Psalms helps us do that. And we're going to look at Psalm 27 this morning. What we're going to see in the very first couple of words, and I'm not going to have it on your screen, but the very first couple of words, it says a Psalm of David. So we know that David, King David, wrote this Psalm. Sometimes the Psalms will tell us exactly where we can find, uh, like exactly what the context was of that particular song. We don't get that here. But we, we will discover that this was a time when David was in crisis. And David was kind of a mess because of that crisis. But, that, but you know, crisis um, was a regular part of David's life. Very early on, as a shepherd boy, man, he had to fought a lion and a bear, right? And we hear he killed him, like, wow, that's awesome. But okay, he faced a lion and a bear. Sounds like a crisis to me. Uh, David is the one who then stared down the giant military commander, Goliath. And the Lord gave him strength to kill him. And then he entered the palace of King Saul, which was good at first. But then Saul got jealous and tried to kill David. And David had to run for his life. And he's hiding in caves. He had the good life. And now he's on the run, abandoned from everybody who was near and dear, other than a few, hiding in caves. He even had to take refuge with the enemy. David understood crisis. So we don't know exactly what was going on here. But he knew crisis very well. So we're going to look at this psalm this morning. I want to begin by looking at the first three verses. We'll break it down in some chunks. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. David's world is a mess, but he is confident. Boy, that's something I want. What gives David this confidence? Let's look at verse 1. Right off the bat, we are going to see the Lord is my light and my salvation. Does the Lord bring light? Yes. Does the Lord bring salvation? Yes. Does the Lord bring protection? Yes. But this is going further. The Lord is my light. The Lord is is my salvation. And that's a much bigger to deal to know that that's who God is. And so before David takes this even further, he is establishing confidence because he is declaring who God is. Man, these are some powerful, beautiful words. The Lord is my light. What does he mean by that? Such a good metaphor, right? Because it, I mean, we can, 
when we think about light. We think about when we're in darkness and then we have light. There's so much that we just automatically know that we, maybe we don't even put words to. But we can take it for granted sometimes. I have a feeling that many of us, if not most of us in this room, when we stepped out this morning, now I know this isn't true for all, everybody in this room, but when we stepped out this morning, very, comfor- very comfortably stepped into a world of light. I'm guessing if, if you were in that position, you probably weren't stepping out and going, thank the Lord, praise God, I have light. And you were like, depending and, and so overly gratitude for light. But if you were amongst a different, in a different category where you were starting in darkness, it, it, it's a much bigger deal, right? We kind of get dulled to the fact that the Lord is the light, and we should never do so. The Lord is my light. What comes to mind? I mean, warmth, comfort, rescue from everything that is dark. It can be pretty scary when you're in the dark. You know, I've mentioned I was in the army, and uh, I, we, we went five weeks advanced camp, um, which is like basic training, but they, they're, tr- they're trying to make you learn how to lead rather than just breaking you down. But, you know, everything that is hard is still there. They're still trying to make it as miserable as possible and see how you do, right? And so we go out for these extended missions. Uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, which was absolutely beautiful unless you're doing army stuff and it's miserable. And... Um, and so they would take us out on these extended missions where we'd like three, four, five, six days out in the woods. And they would just grueling stuff all day and you'd be absolutely exhausted. And then, but you'd have to spend the entire time as if you're actually at war. And so you, know, you always have to have a good defense. And so we really only have a handful of hours to sleep at night. And so we have to set up our perimeter, safety first, and have you know, the plan in place for tomorrow. But, but you can catch a few hours of sleep, but those few hours, it was already dark. So we're already broken down. We're already exhausted. We're in the dark, and we're supposed to lie down, find our our prone position, and then hopefully catch a few hours of sleep. Now, the thing about Fort Lewis, Washington, they had this weird thing in the woods out there where, like, there were some imported ants from some other, some place on the other side of the world. I don't remember where, right? And so I don't like ants. I mean, anybody don't, yeah, we don't like ants, right? These ants were, like, this big. I'm not even exaggerating. And, like, their ant piles they were massive. And so we're going through the day, and I'm like, yep, not going to go there. But at night, get in the perimeter. Okay, I got a few hours to sleep. I'm just going to lie down. You have, there was no opportunity to see if those, you had, you'd be lying right down the middle of those ants. And in the darkness, every twig, every piece of grass felt like one of those ants to me. Lying in the darkness, I'm freaking out. I'm thinking that I'm on these ants, right? And so everything's a wreck. I'm just trying to get some sleep, but it's cold and it's miserable. And then it gets closer to wake up time. And and so we wake up and it's still dark and we're cold and we're miserable. Complete wrecks and um, just praying for Bob to come out. The army, army speak, big orange ball, right? We needed Bob. We were desperate for Bob because until we had that warmth, until, until we could actually see what was around us, we were just a wreck. In the darkness, darkness will do that. And when you have been in the darkness, you realize how desperately you need the light. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? The Lord is also my stronghold. Mm -hmm. Military language. I like this. This is very relevant to me. Um, Military language, right? Uh, we're going to see that a stronghold is going to be necessary because David is, is literally at war. Let's look at the next couple of verses. The war break out against me, even then will I be confident. What does warfare look like? Well, let's see what it looks like for David. When, we'll go back. Yeah, there we go. When evil men advance, and I'm, I see three things in here that help us understand what warfare looks like. First one, evil men advance against me to devour my flesh. That's pretty gnarly. I don't think we're talking about cannibals here. Uh, we got a metaphor here like that the enemy that has come against David, it's like wild animal beasts that are just ripping him to shreds. I don't know about you, but like when I consider the different ways that I might die, being just chewed apart by animals has got to be one of the, the worst ways to go. 
I think that, that feeling of being just chewed apart is also one of the worst ways to live, you know? Do you ever feel like you're just being chewed apart? Second thing we see here. When my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Just, not just one enemy, but waves of enemy. One wave after another. You ever feel like it just, the hits just keep on coming and coming and coming. And here's the wild thing about when you're in the Lord's presence and he's your, here's your stronghold. It doesn't necessarily say that those waves of enemy will stop coming, but they will stumble and fall. So we've got waves of attack. Third thing we see here. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though an army besiege me. We're talking about siege warfare. Pretty common, ancient Near East. I love the old movies that, you know, they'll show the sieges. You've got strongholds, right? Mighty fortresses. I'm picturing Lord of the Rings, even though this, you know, that's whatever. But, um, I mean, we can all picture something where there's, where people who, are, who desire rescue and desire freedom, they've, they have entrenched themselves in a stronghold, um, in a mighty fortress that should, where hopefully they can thrive and they'll be protected. And the enemy will come against them siege warfare. And so you got these mighty armies that will surround these fortresses with the idea of we might not even need to attack them because one of two things is probably going to happen if it's a mighty army. They're going to surround them and to the degree that they cut off all anything from the outside and they're just going to wear them down because there's no supply, no food, no, no, none of the amenities from the outside. And, and a lot of times... The, the entrenched um, army, they would die of starvation, famine, right? Because they could get no help from the outside. But another thing is sometimes they would just surround these fortresses, these strongholds, and they would intimidate them. Have you ever just felt so surrounded by the ugliness out there that you just like, you can't breathe, you feel intimidated, and you just look all around you and you can see no hope, no rescue, though an army besieged me. My heart will not fear. When your army surrounds you, your heart is a mess. Here's the thing. A lot of times I seek refuge in strongholds that don't last, that really are just, just a facade. Like they look like they're strong. Like I can do it in my own ability. I got this. I'm good. And that stronghold, that's, that's not going to cut it when warfare comes. Why do we keep on Seeking strongholds that just aren't strong enough, aren't good enough, when the Lord wants to be your stronghold. If the Lord is your stronghold and you are resting in his presence, if you're resting in his strength, even then will we be confident. My heart will not fear. Will you let the Lord be your stronghold? What happens when you let the Lord be your stronghold? Let's look at the next couple of verses now. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle will I sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. I meant to say this in the previous part, but we got, let's talk about enemies for a second. Though enemies surround me, need to be absolutely clear. Because it's confusing, because David was in real warfare where there was an actual enemy that's coming against him. But that is not the application that the Lord wants for us. Who is our enemy? Very, very easy, especially when hard things are going on in your life, to put, think about our enemy and we see faces. I look across this room and I bet we all see different faces that, that come to light about who is our enemy. Scripture is, or the New Testament is absolutely clear that our enemy is not 
flesh and bone. It is not people. Broken people, which is all of us, do harmful things. So we can look like the enemy. I can look like the enemy. We can each look like the enemy, but we need to be very clear that whoever you start to picture, that is an image bearer of the Lord, a child of God. Ugly things happen. We cannot let the real enemy win because the real enemy is getting in our ear and in our hearts and trying to make us believe and fall to the temptation to start thinking they are the enemy. No. So, in warfare, when we, when we have confidence in the Lord and we know who he is, right, um, all of a sudden we have clarity. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. He has clarity of purpose here, right? When we are in the presence of the Lord, or when we know who God is, everything becomes clear, clear purpose. Number, our purpose is our mission, but our purpose is the presence of God in our lives. He's not asking God to remove enemies. I'm sure he wants that. He's not asking God to, to, to take stuff away. He wants more the presence of the Lord. And the secret for survival in Combat is to desire the Lord's presence first and foremost. David desires that. He desires it um, because he recognizes that the Lord's presence is the safest place to be, right? Um, Where does it say? From the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his temple. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle. The Lord is a hiding place. Have you ever just wanted to curl up in a ball and hide The Lord can be your hiding place, no matter where you are and what is going on. He will hide me in the shelter and set me high upon a rock. The Lord is that rock. And then what happens when we dwell in the house of the Lord? What does that even look like? Well, we get some, we get a, we get a little bit here. We see that so that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And do two things. Gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. Gaze upon the, his beauty and seek him in his temple. Two different things that are necessary aspects of dwelling with the Lord. Gaze upon the Lord. What does that mean? Well, right now, all y'all are looking at me. And right now, I'm looking at all y'all. We are not gazing at each other. If we were, this would get really weird, really weird, real fast, okay? Can you think of that time that you gazed at someone? We had Valentine's last week. Maybe that was a little helpful. Maybe when you've been married 17 years like we have, or a little longer, sometimes you have to do a little remembering of the first time you gazed at each other. And that can kind of help you in the midst of a crazy, chaotic life to gaze once again at someone that you absolutely fell in love with so much that you couldn't stop gazing at their beauty. And I'll tell you what, I think if we were to dig deep, we remember the first time we really gazed at the beauty of the Lord and how that changed us. And if we will dwell in his presence now and moving forward and remember that, we can gaze at his beauty again and it will change us. And then it also says to seek him in his temple, right? Right? Well, we're already seeking. I'm confusing. Now, I'll tell you, these, these two Hebrew words, they're actually different. So I think this one is more accurately to say, I desire to be in God's presence. And this is talking about the physical seeking, right? And so how do we physically seek God? Well, we physically seek God when we seek him in his word, to know God, to study him. Never be satisfied uh, with, with just knowing what we know now of the Lord, but continuing to dig deep, deep, deeper and go further and deeper into his presence, right? The temple being the house of the Lord to know God. And both of these are essential aspects of dwelling with the Lord, to gaze upon his beauty and to seek him in his house. We have to be both because I tell you what, I think the way we're wired, some of us are more into that. I'm going to just gaze at the Lord. I'm just going to worship. And some of us are like, nope, forget worship. I'm just going to study. But if we're going to really dwell in the Lord's presence, we have to be both. Gaze at his beauty and to seek him at his temple. That is dwelling with the Lord. And that is when he can be a stronghold that he wants to be. And that is when we're able to experience him as the light and the salvation do you desire to dwell in his presence? So David is so confident and desires God's presence because one, he knows who God is and he remembers how God has acted before, right? Clearly all this warfare talk, David remembers how God has been a stronghold and a light in the past. 
Do you remember how you've seen God act in the past? Do you remember where you've seen God shown up to be your light and your salvation and your stronghold, right? I remember. I want to share a little, just a little bit testimony here. You know, this is kind of funny. Last week, if you're here, Justin shared his, um, shared from a passage, which was the first one he preached at Houston Church 12 years ago. And I was already, Lord already led me to this passage, and it just so happens Psalm 27 is the first passage that I preached at Houston Church, which was almost 10 years ago. A lot had changed for him. And he mentioned the passage is still the same, but you know, the, the way we see God and, and just our experience from the passage changes. And that's true for me here too. And so if y'all were here then, you heard me share my testimony, my, ar- my story in the army of how God uh, just showed his presence in an incredible way and it changed me. And I'm not going to do that whole thing. It's because I, I, it, it, um, sometimes I share the story, like an hour version, and um, it's pretty cool to see how God works. I'm not giving you the hour version. Um, but some highlights. You know, I signed up for the Army, and I just wanted a scholarship, and I stepped into it, and I signed the dotted line, I realized I hated it, right? <laughs> like, this is nuts. What did I sign up, up for? God wants me to suffer. But as I continued to step deep into it, by my junior year, all of a sudden, I started to see God's goodness in this and saw that, he, that I was actually really enjoying it and was good at some, at the, some of the stuff that I was being called to do. I was just right where I needed to be. And so that's awesome. So I'm going to go into the Army and, uh, you know, I report to the school in August 2001, and then everybody knows what happened in September. 2001, when the world turned upside down. Whew, what have I gotten into? I remember my civilian boss at the time, because I hadn't even started the school, um, we were boxing up urine samples, and um, I reported to her that day, and she said, you joined the Army at the wrong time. But I had a peace knowing I was in the Army at the right time. It's not that I wanted warfare, but this is what God had prepared me for. And, and I, I was seeing his goodness, and I was trusting him. So I went to South Korea, came back, was very excited to finally have some time in the United States after a year and a quarter being overseas. My very first formation with 82nd Airborne Division, the commander gets in front of us and says, men, we're going to Iraq. We're leaving in three weeks. We were there in about eight days. And uh, my <laughs> good news is my shipment from Korea hadn't even gotten, arrived yet, so I didn't have to, like, I hadn't unpacked, so you know, just put that in storage. So I went to Iraq, and God was faithful. It was hard, um, but I saw his goodness. And I came back, and the Lord led me. Uh, and, and some wild stuff happened. You can get the extended version later, but um, the Lord led me to my wife, and we, Deanna. And we were just so excited to have this time together, right? And uh, um, I was, the Lord was, uh, the next step was I was going to go to school in Arizona. And I'm like, yes, it's like an extended honeymoon. We get to be in school and just enjoy this time. It's supposed to be there for a year. And a few months into it, they're like, nope. Uh, President Bush has authorized the surge. They need more troops. So we're pulling you out and a bunch of these other lieutenants. And you're going to join this training team in Iraq. So honeymoon over very abruptly. And we were just a wreck. God, what are you doing? (laughs) The Lord is my salvation. Whom shall I fear? He showed his goodness. And so we went into a very hostile neck of the woods just north of Baghdad. And I mean, there was tough stuff very early on. But um, the surge was working, and we were able to clear out much of the enemy. And then, but um, February 12th, which was last week, by the way, 17-year anniversary, 16, yeah. Um, February 12th, uh, we were going on a mission, one of the last areas. That we, the enemy had been cleared out of most of the areas, and we're doing a mission. Gunshots ring out. Bam! I felt like I got hit by a bat on the side of my face and all this blood flies out and it felt like a glancing blow right here because all the pain is right here. Well, the, they get us out of the battlefield and I'm in the hospital and I'm like, it was a glancing blow right here. This is, uh, this is where all the pain is. But I, no- I noticed that I'm covered in blood. Not sure what that's all about. I mean, there's a lot of blood that flew out, but I'm covered in blood. What's going on? He said, that's not a glancing blow. That's an exit wound. Well, hold on now. If there's an exit wound, that means there's an entrance wound. Entrance wound. Now I'm talking, I'm coherent. Like this doesn't even sound possible, what we're talking about right now. There's my face and you're telling me this is an exit wound. And so the doctors are messing with my whole body and they're looking around and they're like, well, actually, yeah, you have a hole right here and you have a hole right here. Three weeks later, I found out that uh, there was, my body armor was a, was a, a huge mess. And, um, and then they found the entrance wound. There was the exit wound. It was all the way on the other side of my face. Something had passed in here and out there. But oh, by the way, and I was very confused for like three weeks, because we only heard one gunshot when it happened. Figured out the path of the bullet. One shot, in there, out there, 
impact here in the body armor, shrapnel explosion, so bullet, vest, explosion. A piece came up, came in there, passed all the way through my face, came out on the other side. Like a Swiss cheese or something, right? And, um, but I'm so confused because I'm sitting up and I'm talking and it hurts right here, but I don't feel like I've had a bullet pass through my body twice. And they took an MRI and they're like, yeah, we'll, we'll do the MRI and we'll figure out what we need to do for surgery. And so I'm lying in the hospital bed and they come by and they're like, we've had the results of the MRI. And it turns out that bullet passed through without hitting anything significant. And whatever went through your face, you know, it missed all the good stuff. And you just have a partially broken jaw. So you just need to rest a couple weeks. I'm lying in this bed and the chaplain comes up and she has no idea. She just goes to everybody. She was real sweet. And she, uh, she had no idea what I'd been through. Like I'm talking. So she's like, oh, so maybe he was just a little thing, right? And she's like, can I, can I give you a Bible? Yes, please, this Bible. Can, can I read scripture? Yes. And she read Psalm 27. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon a be- his beauty and seek him in his te- temple. And I just heard the Lord speaking into, into my soul in a way that I'd never e- experienced before in my life, even though I'd known the Lord and seen his presence. And he was saying, I knew I was gazing upon his beauty, and he was saying, Russ, I am here. I did this just as I've always been with you. You know, you are experiencing my presence and knowing my presence as you always have. And, and Deanna, it was a little wild when she got that phone call saying your husband was shot in the face, but, you know, the Lord just showed up in a really cool way here. And so, I, you know, this song, I go back to it as we sit here in a bit of a crisis, and I remember what God had done then and that our God never changes and never fails. And no matter what kind of crazy emotions you're dealing with, when we remember what our God has done, and I know there's, there are stories throughout this room, maybe not actual bullets, but man, I know there's stories throughout this room. Our God is faithful. And when we rest in his presence, it changes us. Let's look at the next slide. Verse six, or verse uh, Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle, will I sacrifice with shouts of joy, I will sing and make music to the Lord. When we experience God's presence and and we know him to be a stronghold and our light and our salvation, it will change us. Look at what it led to in David's life. I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the, to the Lord. First thing we see is that David worships. David is in the midst of war, but he will worship. We gather here every Sunday morning and we worship. When we do it knowing that who our God is and what our God has done and we, get a, and we feel and know that God is our light, We can't help but worship. But I think this is talking much more than our Sunday morning worship, right? We are called to to live our lives as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, to live a lifestyle of worship. And to as we go, and even when we're in crisis, because boy, the world notices, well, (laughs) you're a wreck, but but you you are praising God. How is that even possible, right? When we live our lives as living sacrifices, it is amazing the worship that comes out of us and how the worship that people see in us, um, how it changes them. God's presence leads to worship. And then look at the fruit that is born of that. I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. Just this last Monday, I got to be with college students at, at Redlands. We do, I've been going through a book with them and just hitting different topics. And... Um, we talked about the difference between happiness and joy this last week. Happiness, boy, that's a good thing, but happiness is based on our circumstances. Circumstances are going to change. We're going to have good circumstances where we're happy. We're going to have bad circumstances. And you know what? To put on that mask and say, I'm happy, that's a lie. I am not happy about a lot, a lot of what I have experienced, a lot of what we have experienced, a lot of what others have experienced over the last few weeks. I'd be lying to say that I have had happiness throughout the entirety of all that. But 
but the joy of the Lord never left. The joy of the Lord, when we experience God's presence, he gives us his joy. That is a fruit of the Spirit. And I used to think like, okay, fruit of the Spirit, that means I need to try really hard to do these things. No, 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 that means when you have the Spirit of God changing your, your, your life, this is what comes out. You can have joy in the midst of whatever you are dealing with. And that joy is the kind of stuff that will change you because you are like, yeah, bullets are flying, animals are devouring, but I am in God's presence and I have the joy of the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. The cute little kid's song. It always comes to mind with that. But when it was written by Paul, it was not a cute little kid's song. The Apostle Paul was in prison. Prison. And he's talking over and over again about joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. And he meant it. Because that joy, when we have from the presence of the Lord, man, that is a lifeline. And that's what he gives us. What's interesting, shouts of joy is not three words in the Hebrew. That's one word. That's a battle cry. What's your battle cry? You probably don't have a battle cry, but what do you picture with battle cry, right? I picture uh, somebody, somebody posted, probably Trina, posted a meme with a, with a brave heart, right? And freedom, right? that's what I picture is a battle cry, right? If you are in the presence of the Lord and he is your stronghold, your battle cry, shouts of joy. That's what that one word is. You want to know another time that that, that, that shout of joy shows up in, in the Old Testament? Jericho. People of Israel. You're going to go fight the mighty stronghold Jericho. No, oh, you, you see that place? That's one of the mightiest strongholds ever. We don't have enough weapons. We don't have, they didn't actually say that for that. They said that earlier. But can you imagine? They go to Jericho. What does God do? March around the army, blow a bunch of trumpets, shouts of joy, and God gave the victory. Let shouts of joy be your battle cry as you're in the Lord's presence. <laughs> Let's go on. All right. I love verses 1 through 6. Like I told you, I was lying in that hospital bed, and um, th- that, that became a battle anthem for me, pretty much, verses 1 through 6. And I got to verse 7, and I'm like, the many, 10 years ago, 16 years ago, when I would teach this psalm and talk about this psalm, I just really wouldn't even deal with verses 7 through 12. Because I didn't really understand what was going on here. Because we're going to see that David's a little bit of a wreck. And how can you be a wreck? How can you be struggling, right? How can you say all these things that sound like a lack of faith, if I'm being honest, after you just express those confidence? So I'm going to just focus on 1 through 6, come back around to verse 13 and 14, which is really good. But we're not, we're not going to skip verses 7 through 12, because we, I, we're going to see that 7 through 12 is one of the most important parts of this psalm. 7 through 10. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, O God, my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Receive me. What's going on here? David just sounds like a wreck. All these emotional words, right? I really don't know what to do with emotions sometimes. But David here is emotional. Is that really okay? What is the purpose of the Psalms? The Psalms is to see that yes, even when we're confident, even when we're faithful, we're human and we are going to have just a huge tangled mess of emotions. And that is okay. God doesn't want us to ignore emotions. God wants us to be real with him, to plead with him, to say, God, I don't like this part. This really stinks, but I'm going to praise your name anyways. God, I'm freaking out a little bit here, but I'm going to claim confidence because I know you're good. And that's what we see here. My heart says of you, seek his face, because I'm a whole bunch of mess right now, but I know that I need that intimate presence. So Lord, are you going to give it to me or what? Because right now it seems like my world's falling apart and I'm apart and I'm not happy with this at all. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn me away. And so when I started to read these verses and understand, you know, when Deanna and I found out that we were, that I was going to deploy for a year in Iraq, plus three months of training in Kansas. So 15 months apart, newlyweds, happy, happy, new, happy uh, honeymoon. Um, you know, we would take turns freaking out. You know, we would, one of us would talk about confidence while the other one was crying. The next day, it would be, it would be the other one who was just, oh, I can't sleep. You know, all the anxious emotions. It's okay. It's okay. And I mean, we were a mess. And these verses tell me, you know what? 
We're not supposed to ignore emotions. Emotions are okay. Emotions are not bad. It's how we deal with emotions. God wants us to bring emotions uh, to him. A tangled mess, right? Um, I feel like sometimes my emotions, it's like, it's like when I bust the really long hose out. And every time I try to put it away properly, so I'm not going to have a mess, but inevitably, when I put it away the next time, it's a big, huge, tangled mess once again. So here I go. Got to untangle the hose, right? Maybe, maybe it's cables that you've dealt with. Have you all ever had that knot is just, that just shows up every time, even though you try to, right? Y'all know the knot. Y'all have struggled with the knot. I feel like the emotions here from David is just a big, whole, tangled knot. Did you know there's something called knot theory? I'd never heard of that. Not theory. So you got all these, all these uh, scientific nerd types. I mean, just scientists, right? They, like, they study knots. And like, if I look at it close enough, I can analyze the knot, and I, we, we can figure out how to, to get out of the knot. But here's knot theory, what they've discovered. Step number one, to start loosening the knot and making sense out of the knot. You want to know what it was? To hold it up to the light. The Lord is the light in my salvation. Now, I didn't get that on my own this week. It was kind of cool. I was listening to one of my favorite podcasts who interviewed Jenny Allen talking about her, her new book, Untangle Your Emotions. I haven't read the whole thing. I've read the first two chapters, which, but they're awesome. I uh, just want to read a little bit her journey as she kind of discovered untangling the knot. She says, over the past three years, I've committed myself to holding my tangled feelings to the light and with each loosening of a knot, I've experienced more freedom. Freedom to breathe, to laugh, to cry, to rage, to rejoice. Freedom to live. I've discovered a style of living in which other people could know me, and I could also know them miraculously. I could know myself when I thought and what I felt. I could know God. I could live authentically connected to God. I could learn to feel my feelings instead of pressuring myself to fix everything. I could heal from a past marked by running. I could experience real life, give myself permission to respond with real emotion, and even learn to enjoy it. I could start to untangle the mess created when we refuse to take the time to work out the kinks in our connections between our loved ones and God and ourselves. After decades spent skimming the surface, I could choose to finally go deep. I could explore the emotional depth of life. I could change. I saw that there was another way to live, that by experiencing my feelings instead of stuffing them or denying them, I could live a far more fulfilling life. I learned that by sharing what I was feeling with real, live human beings, I could have deeper community than I'd ever expected before. So what I see in the Psalms, especially in this messy part, it's one of the best parts. It's, it's acknowledging the fact that sometimes we're a knot. But when we're, we'll hold that knot of, a no, knot of emotions up to the light, the Lord is my light and my salvation, there can be beautiful freedom. It's not from ignoring emotions, but by holding it to the light. Speaking of tangled emotions, like I said, I've spent many, many times in this psalm, teaching this psalm, Never before has verse 10 impacted me the way it's, uh, it's impacted me recently in these last few weeks. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Though my father and mother forsake me. Now, the term that's used in the original language, it could actually be interpreted a few different ways. What, what did David actually mean by saying, though my father and mother forsake me? He could be saying, if my father and mother forsake me, he could be saying, forsake could mean that like, mom and dad, they're not there anymore. Maybe they've moved away. Maybe they died. Maybe, you know, there's a lot of possibilities. But what is clear is, though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. What he is saying, there is no kind of hurt that compares to family hurt. Family hurt, that cuts deep, Right? And I'll tell you what, when you're in family, there will be hurt. That, that, that's just part of the world we live in. But man, it cuts deep. When family, family members leave, when family mem members, members um, when they say hurtful things, the loss of a family, 
There, there's not much harder than that. Mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters of Christ. So I'm not afraid of a smaller church, right? Because I actually think it's kind of cool when God stirs things up. But family hurts. It's hard. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is a strong me, a stronghold. And no matter what, we, what kind of hurt we experience, you know, with relationships with other people, the Lord will receive me. The Lord does not change. The Lord brings healing where there's brokenness. It takes time, but the Lord will heal. And man, I'm thankful for these verses in Psalm 27. Let's move on. And just real quickly, on, as, he, as, as he's wrestling with his emotions, David, teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Now, like you see David, he's like, I'm confident, I'm confident, and I'm trying to be faithful. And you know, I know it one step at a time, right? And I will be confident, but I'm struggling right now. And why is he struggling right now? Well, it's interesting because we've been talking about physical attacks from the enemy, but it sounds like it wasn't only physical attacks. Do not turn me over to the desires of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. Words hurt. I don't know what was going on with David, but he was experiencing words that hurt, false witnesses, things that are untrue, things that are just hurtful, word, breathe, they feel like violence. What a powerful illustration. Words breathing out violence. Our words matter. Sticks and stones may break our bones, but words may never hurt me. Okay. That was written for the person receiving the words to know that like you can choose how you receive those words and how you respond and let the Lord do some stuff there. But for the one giving the words, you need to know that that is not true. Words do hurt. And we need to be very careful with our words. We all need to be very careful with our words. We're a church in transition. Transition involving conflict, right? Division. When those things happen... Because we are all sinful, broken people, hurtful words, they happen, okay? We need to have grace for each other, and we need to choose that we will not be the ones that give in to the deceits of the enemy. We're, we're, like, we're going to start slinging around hurtful words. We must be the healing people that, that are going to rise above and use words that show the goodness of God to the people in our family and to a world that is watching. We need to choose the ways of Jesus who showed us what, what it means um, to, to live in light of God's goodness and for his mission. And on his way to the, his cross, he was, his own people were mocking him and spitting on him and rejecting him. And what does he do? He prays, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And this is a totally different situation, but it shows us that the Jesus way says, I will not, I will watch my words. Uh, I will not be the one that breathes out violence. Words matter. Let's look at the last two verses. I told you they're my favorite. See how much time I gave us for that. Okay. David comes full circle. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. Wait for the Lord. What powerful words right here. I will see his goodness. This is a, the first sermon in a series that, uh, that I'm going to start. Joel will preach a couple times. Um, towards the end, talking about forgiveness. He's been uh, pastoring his church in, with the theme of forgiveness. So I'm excited to, for him to bring some of that in a couple of weeks. But we're going we're gonna to focus on the sermon series is, we will see his goodness. We will see his goodness. David is confident. He's taken us a journey through warfare, but I am confident of this. We will see his goodness. How have you seen God's goodness? You know, I've been asking that question as we've met with a staff, and um, I've asked other people, like, where have you seen God show up? Where have you seen his goodness? And just some, some really cool answers. First of all, just the encouragement. 
I can't even tell you how many people texted me this morning, how many people I've heard from. Just conversations in the hall with so many of you. The encouragement is amazing. And when you go through a crisis, just one of the coolest parts about it is how, how much stronger relationships grow in the midst of whatever that crisis may be, right? Um, and I'm seeing some of that. We're seeing some of that. Um, there are volunteers that, are, that had served in places that are no longer serving here, and, and people are already stepping up and saying, I, I will serve. I will do what I can. And, uh, you know, we're kind of figuring out. We're going to talk more about that in the coming weeks because we don't even know exactly what all the pieces of the pie are that need to be filled, right? But, um, but people are already saying, I will, and we're seeing that. There's been great conversations, parents and our, our kids and youth workers, about what, is it, what does it mean for the parents to, to step up and, take, and, and really own discipleship of their kids? Because we were, we've always been partners in discipleship, right? We're parents of the primary discipleship, disciplers, and those conversations are happening. Many people have made, made mention of how special it is that family members are praying for us. Family members who, who may not have been here, part of Houston Church for a long time or ever, people are praying and that is good. There is, God's goodness is showing up. Showing up, and it's going to continue to show up. I'll tell you what, I had plans. I, I never, ever thought I would cons- even consider a lead pastor role. And, and right now I'm in an interim role. Um, but, I, you know, the Lord was leading me to do other things. And suddenly I woke up one day, and here I am. And just the peace I have to know, you know what? God has me here for a reason. I know that for many, God has us here for a reason. And that peace is an incredible thing. That's the goodness of God. And so what do we do that? We're going to wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. That's the language of Joshua, Moses and Joshua, right? Be strong in the Lord and take heart. Be strong and courageous. Very similar to what Paul has said in the New Testament. Stand firm in the faith. And as we do that, we wait. Waiting is not a passive thing. Waiting is a very active thing. As we wait on the Lord, we seek him. That means we spend time in his word on, on our own. Just, Lord, I'm going to be in your presence. And then we, as we wait, we are going to continue gathering together. And we're going to embrace koinonia-type fellowship, recognized because of who we are in Christ, the connection we, ha- we have with each other. It is significant. And in our waiting, we're going to be the church. And we're going to grow stronger together. And in our, our, our waiting, we're going to sp- seek the spirit of the Lord so that the God's spirit changes us. And we're going to be a church of prayer and truth. And we're going to praise him and worship. We are going to be the church in our waiting. I know that we all have questions. God doesn't always answer right away. I don't have all, those, <laughs> all the answers right now that, that you think someone like myself might have at the moment. Because we are waiting the Lord and we're going to be faithful and God's goodness will reign. Just uh, as a final voice of what will we do as we wait, I want to return to our, the strong voice from earlier. Thank you, Elmo, for getting us kicked off, and I think he has a great last word. He says, wow, Elmo's glad he asked. Elmo learned that it is important to ask a friend how they're doing. Elmo will check again soon, friends. Elmo loves you. Wise words from a puppet. The New Testament is full of these things that we call the one another's. Care for one another. Encourage one another. Spur one another on to love and good deeds, right? We have to be about the one another's. We have to check in, each on, uh, in and on each other. And by each other, I mean those here and the family members that separate ways, right? We have to continue loving each other and loving well. It begins by knowing God's presence, loving God and experiencing him as the light, the salvation, and our strongholds. And when we have his presence in our lives, that is going to overflow in ways that, that will lift us all up together and it will change this community. And Houston Church will be the church that gives you glory, lives on mission that has been over 100 years. And I'm excited for the new way it's going to happen now because it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be powerful. So right now, Jared's going to lead us in time of worship. If you're on the prayer team, if you'd like to come up now, you you can come up later too, but maybe we have some of our prayer team members that are standing up and available for you. If you want to to pray with anyone, please do that. But let's seek the Lord. Seek his goodness and his presence. And just, Lord, as we wait, where are you leading me? Let's have some time in worship.